Oh, wow. Calm down, calm down. That's the most efficient calming down I've seen in some time. Uh, I think it's a very well-behaved audience. That's fantastic. Thank you all very much uh, for coming along in such a uh, polite, orderly fashion. Thank you very much, Deborah, who has vanished uh, for introducing me uh, so nicely. Uh, as she said, my name is Matt Parker. I am here to talk to you about things to see and hear in the fourth uh, dimension. Before we go racing into that, uh, a little bit uh, about myself. So, oh, actually most of my um, information is up there. You can see my name is Matt Parker. I work at Queen Mary University of London. I Actually, I used to be a uh, maths teacher. Actually, have we got any maths teachers in? <laughs> All sat down the front, brilliant, okay. Uh, no surprises there. So I used to be, like if you've been brought along by a maths teacher, like one of your uh, fine standard uh, normal maths teachers, and <laughs> no maths teachers are truly normal, are they? Uh, well, I used to be a regular maths teacher, and then I've gradually drifted into a much more um, varied career. So at the University at Queen Mary, uh, which is a university in East London, I work in the maths department. I am the Public Engagement in Mathematics Fellow. Um, <laughs> you're laughing at my career. Thanks for that. That's... <laughs> don't, don't, don't patronize me. Uh, so uh, we'll, get, we'll get racing into this, and uh, it is going to be a night of my favorite bits of uh, mathematics. I'm going to show you my all-time uh, favorite shape. It is pretty spectacular. Uh, and I'm going to hopefully show you some other practical bits of mathematics uh, along the way. Um, but we will start uh, properly by doing some mathematics. So can everyone who brought their calculator, uh, could you take that out now? Really? That is the most movement I have ever seen <laughs> on everyone take out your... Uh, genuinely, has anyone got... Okay, I'm seeing a lot of phones. Uh, that is, has anyone got an actual calculator? Re oh, that's so good. Was that, is that a, it's a Casio, very nice. Can anyone beat a Casio? Another Casio? They're both from the FX series, it looks like, from here. They're standard school issue ones. Someone... Another Casio, very nice. No one's brought like a hilarious slide ruler or something that has happened. What have you got? Who? Oh, is that Texas Instruments? Fantastic. All right. This is just my game of guess the calculator. Uh, okay, so whatever your calculation device is, uh, don't feel intimidated now if you've just got your phone. Uh, I want you to uh, type into it any two-digit number that takes your fancy. If uh, people have been to the Christmas lecture filming, this is one of the things I do when I've got a lot of time to fill. So some of you may have seen me do this trick before, but it's one of my absolute favorite maths tricks. So what I want you to do, without talking, is to type in your two-digit number, then hit multiply, type in the same two-digit number again, hit multiply, type in the same two-digit number a third time, and then hit equals. And what you have done is you've calculated the cube of your original two-digit numbers. Those two digits times the same two digits times the same two digits again. And what you've done is the kind of long, tedious part of mathematics, the multiplying things over and over. Right? This is why we have calculators. Right? The fun bit of maths, though, is what you can do with the answer. Is there anyone who, is, uh, who has an answer on their screen, they've cubed their two-digit number, and they're prepared to share it? Is there anyone who, who's happy to share? OK, I'm going to go with a very keen uh, girl there. Uh, yes, the one now looking nervous, pointing at herself. Yes, could you, could you read out up there? Could you, is someone trying to steal your calculator? <laughs> You're like, wait, this is too much pressure. Give me that. All right, OK, she, I think she can do it. OK, can you read out what answer have you got there? 17,576. Okay, so you had to very carefully cube 26 to get that. <laughs> calm down, calm down. Uh, who shouted, I did it? Did someone else do 26? No. No. <laughs> but you did something else. That's excellent. I'm, thanks for joining in. Uh, so, actually, what, what, what answer have you got on the screen down there? Now, now that we have started what I believe is a conversation. 6,084. Okay, 6,084. Did you put in 14 and cube that? No. No. Excellent. I regret starting this conversation. <laughs> so, 
Uh, Atil, I will come back to you. In fact, I suspect you're going to feature heavily tonight. Uh, I will come back to you in a moment, so just wait there, right? So what I'm actually doing, by the way, is not a difficult calculation. I'm not doing a long, tedious uh, cube root in my head. I'm doing uh, a bit of a trick. And so I would do a few in, so I would do three in quick succession, and then if I get all three correct, you go the correct amount uh, of wild. So is there one person over here who's prepared to, okay, I'm going to go uh, guy behind the sparkly hat over there. In fact, if, if this works, you, uh, you can have the sparkly hat as a prize. Okay, and it's disappeared, there you are. It's, uh, you wouldn't believe they, they convert straight to gas at room temperature. Okay, so we've got you in a second, remain calm. Okay, uh, one over here, who have we, okay, Miss Reluctant Lady right in the middle, and then you don't get a hat, I'm afraid. Uh, you know what? Forage nearby. Uh, and then who over, okay, uh, keen person over here, who's taking your glasses off in shock, me? Yes, right, okay, so, uh, so we're going to do them in reverse order. So you're going to, in a second, you're going to call your answer out, so many thousands and then the rest. And then we'll come, uh, where have you gone? Over here. And then you're looking more nervous by the minute. It's fine. Uh, and then we come over here to you, sir, right? And if I get all three correct, wild. Okay, right. What have you got on the screen over here? You put in 23. Fifty-two. Okay, nodding silently is <laughs> perfectly acceptable. Yes, and over here? Uh, you've put in 49. So what was the number again? Oh, 704,000. Uh, I suspect that, at a guess, it's going to be 89. <laughs> I don't entirely feel like I earned that. Uh, so, right, now what I'm doing is, uh, like I said, it's just a crude, I've got two rules. One rule that tells me the first digit of the original number, and a second rule that tells me the second digit of the original number. And uh, I'm not doing anything other than just bluntly applying those two rules. So as you read it out, I'm listening to the digits and applying those two, those two patterns to work out what they are. So if you cube something that's not a two-digit number, then uh, I won't know. I will just take whatever the answer is and put it through the same algorithm. Them. And if I mishear it, I thought you said 104,000, and I wasn't smart enough to know that's not the cube of a two-digit number, so I still applied the same two rules. Uh, now, uh, the two rules, by the way, are incredibly easy, and if you knew what they are, you would not be impressed at all, uh, which is why I'm not going to explain them. But uh, if you want to learn them, if you want to learn them when you get home tonight, right, get a calculator, get some paper, get a pen, maybe invite some friends over, right? <laughs> Have a maths party, right? And if you, uh, you can serve triangle-shaped snacks. Uh, if you cube a lot of two-digit numbers, you will very quickly see the patterns come out, right? So start cubing two-digit numbers, look for the patterns, and sooner or later, you can learn uh, what this is. But to do something slightly more difficult, and this is right now, this is the warm-up over, uh, to do something slightly more difficult, I have brought with me, and you can put your calculators away, I have brought with me one of my favorite maths toys. I have it here. It is the Rubik's Cube. I'm going to attempt to solve this for you uh, live on stage. Before I do that, because people will accuse me of prearranging it, I'm going to give it to you. Would you mind taking that and mixing it up, right? So mix that up so it's in a random arrangement. I'm going to attempt to solve for you uh, the Rubik's Cube. Oh, has anyone got a timer? Could one person get their timing device back up? Who have I not interacted with yet? Yes, miss. Okay, would you mind when I start? If you're solving that, you're in so much trouble. <laughs> Mix it up, right? And so I better get all the stickers back, right? And so, Miss, uh, when I start solving it, you, you start timing. Did when it's solved it... <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> Thank goodness. Give me that. Give me that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, when I start solving... Are you just texting a friend? <laughs> you wouldn't believe what's in the show. Right, so you start... I, have you opened a time? You're putting your phone away now. It didn't have a timer. It hasn't got a timer. Right, so, so you said, no oh, problem, I'll time you, I'll get my... You didn't even pretend. Yeah. You could have just counted the seconds. Okay, so you've, you've now stolen a phone. Okay, does this one have a timer? Yeah. 
Okay. To be fair, this show is involving a lot more admin than I expected. Uh, could you, when I start solving it, start the timer? All right. At the end, once I've got it, once it's finished, before when I finish it, no one react. Right. Uh, at the very end, could you call the timeout if you deem that suitably impressive? You can start applauding. Okay. Right. Here we go. So, and the time starts. No. <laughs> Did you start? Good, right. Only if I say now, you start, but not that. You get <laughs> the time starts now. Okay, right. So uh, people might think that a Rubik's Cube is famously very difficult to solve. So how on earth uh, can I solve it in a timely fashion? And to be honest, if I don't get this done in the first 20 to 30 minutes, we'll just pack up and go home. Uh, and then we just call the show off at that point. Uh, in fact, uh, you can learn how to solve the Rubik's Cube. You can learn what combinations of twists move different bits of it around. And the current world record for solving a Rubik's Cube is 23.19 seconds. How long have I been going for? 30. 30. Oh, several people are timing me. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Uh, so anyway, I've been going for over half a minute, so uh, a, more, a more impressive me would be done by now. Uh, but if there are any Rubik's Cube experts in, and believe me, it is very likely, uh, you will know that 23.19 seconds is actually not the current world record for solving a Rubik's Cube. That is the current world record for solving a Rubik's Cube while you're blindfolded. So yeah, think that through, right? Someone was given a Rubik's Cube and proceeded to solve it in under half a minute. In fact, uh, there are all sorts of ridiculous world records for solving Rubik's Cubes. There's a world record for solving the Rubik's Cube while underwater, 19.01 seconds. There's a world record for solving a Rubik's Cube solely with your feet, which is currently 23.14 seconds. And I have solved it in... Wow. One minute, 18.95. One minute, 18.95? <laughs> I'll take it. All right, so... What I absolutely love about the Rubik's Cube, and the reason I could solve it is actually, I can bring it up on the screen uh, here, so if you can't, there we go, right. Oh, that's a, that's a lot less flattering than I was hoping for. Okay, so, uh, so the Rubik's Cube, what I love about it is that it, it's a perfect example of a 3D cube because it spins in three different directions. It spins that way, it spins that way, and it spins that way. And when you're solving the Rubik's Cube, the middle bits, those middle squares, never move. They remain perfectly still. They are effectively the kind of 3D axis of the Rubik's Cube. There we go. And, f and pause. Perfect, right, so, uh, so as I move it around, all I'm doing is, uh, re with reference to those points that never budge, I've learned what twists in the three different directions move all the different stickers, or, well, different pieces, actually, into the correct positions. And with a bit of practice, <laughs> turns out all the instructions are on YouTube, with a bit of practice, you can learn to do it reasonably uh, quickly. For proper nerd cred, though, under 30 seconds. And my best time is, I can just break a minute. I'm not brilliant. Uh, but I, I attempt to solve it while uh, socializing. So that's my attempt at a record. Uh, if people want to have a play with the Rubik's Cube afterwards, please do uh, come down and have a look at it. And the fact that it is a, a 3D cube, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And uh, my idea behind the talk today is eventually, via some practical maths, I'm going to work my way up to showing you the fourth dimension. In fact, my all-time favorite shape only works in four dimensions. So just like uh, this is our 3D cube, I'm going to try and work our way up to shapes that exist in more dimensions than we have. But it's fine. We're not going to go racing straight into it. We're going to gradually warm up, and we're going to finish uh, with a 4D version of the cube. So. Uh, before that, I have promised some practical mathematics, so I thought we'd just get that out of the way now. I'm going to show you uh, the mathematical way to tie your shoelaces. And uh, this, I mean, you can save an incredible amount of time if you tie your shoes the maths way. So if I bring this camera around, because I'm well aware you can't, you can't all see my shoes, right? But if I set a camera up down here, actually, if I put it over here, right, so in theory, if I get that there, okay, right, so if I put my foot in front of that, can you all... Yeah. Oh, and you can see the one behind, oh wait, okay, there you go. It's like, it's like the world's nerdiest chorus line, look at that, right, okay, anyway, so you can see my... This show's going in a lot of unexpected directions. <laughs> okay, so you can see my shoelace here. In fact, if I angle that down a second, it'll be a little bit less 
There we are. Okay, right, so I'm going to tie my shoe the mathematical way. And the way this works is, you start with uh, the two laces with like a foundation knot, and you just hold them. And most people do some kind of ridiculous moving the laces around and whatnot, right? In reality, what you can do is once you've done the foundation knot, if you just cross the two laces over, they'll tie themselves. And s that's the correct amount of amazed. Uh, so I'm, I, would you like to learn? Yes. All right, so uh, if you, I'll do it again. I'm going to give you a few seconds. Uh, if you've got shoes with laces, choose your favorite shoe, undo the laces. If you haven't got laces, odds are the person next to you does, and they're not using at least one shoe, right? So everyone get some laces within reach. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Okay, so, undo the laces, but do that foundation knot, like what you can see I've got tied on my shoe so far. Then, if you have a close look at the foundation knot, one lace is going backwards and one's going forwards. So take the one that goes backwards, curl it up and over so it's going forward, and hold it on the way down, like that. And then take the one that's already going forward and curl it backwards and hold it on the way down over there. Now all you have to do is take the two bits you're holding, put them under the other loop, swap hands, pull tight, and you've got a knot. Okay, is there? Is there a delay on that? Oh, sorry. Okay, right. So I'll tell you what, I'll do it. I'll do it again. Because there's a delay. If you miss it... Just very quickly look slightly to the left, all right, and you'll see it again. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to do it one last time, then I'm going to give you... Yeah. I'll do it again with instructions on the screen, and then I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to have a go, and then we'll carry on with the talk. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to untie my laces here. We have picture-in-picture picture instructions. So you start with the back one curling forward, hold it on the way down. The front one curling back, hold it on the way down. And then you cross them both under the other loop, swap hands, pull tight, and it's done. The great thing about doing that, not only will you save seconds of your life every day, but the knot you end up with is mathematically the same as the standard knot you get doing it the really long way. And so you're not, you know, you're not sacrificing not quality, but you are doing it an awful lot quicker. And I can say that it is mathematically the same because there's an area of maths called knot theory. There are mathematicians called knot theorists, which is the best name ever, and, uh, but they are theorists, they just look at knots. And so there may be a few puns in this section. Uh, and so knot theorists uh, study, study knots, and sadly at the moment, Humankind's understanding of knots is terrible. Humans are just, we are not good at knots whatsoever. <laughs> and knot theorists do not have a reliable way to work out how to undo a knot. And so, for example, if I show you uh, this knot up on the screen here, in fact, this is a picture uh, from my book, that knot, oh, and the convention when you draw a knot is if the string goes underneath, then you just leave a little gap, right? So where it goes underneath, it disappears briefly and comes out the other side. So they're not just little bits of string, uh, they go underneath each other and the rest. We have no idea what the best way is to undo that knot. No idea. And the way that we like to undo knots is you can choose one bit where the string goes underneath and you can cut it from underneath, bring it on top and join it together. We call that a crossing switch because you take one bit which crosses underneath and you switch it to cross on top. And at the moment, the world record for undoing this knot is three crossing switches. So if you swap it in three places, it will come completely undone and you'll get a loop of string with no tangles in it whatsoever. No one has ever found a way to undo this with two crossing switches. No one has ever managed to prove 
prove you can't undo this knot with two crossing switches. It is an unknown open bit of mathematics. It is called the 1011 knot. Uh, I put it in my book because what I want people to do is to make it out of string and then have a go. And it won't be in this arrangement because people have tried all the crossing switches in this arrangement. But if you make it in that arrangement and then you pick it up and move it around so different bits cross each other and then you make two crossing switches and take a photo of you pointing at them because if, if it works and you can't recreate it, no deal, right? But if it does work, if you if you take a photo of you pointing at two bits, you then make crossing switches at those two points, and it becomes undone, and you then send me an email, right? Uh, mathematical fame and fortune are yours. <laughs> for a very narrow definition of fame and fortune. Uh, and so, and there are other ones. This is just the easiest one I can come across. Oh, I've had one email so far. The book came out in October. Someone sent me an email and said, I, that, like, I did the knot. I'm like, oh my goodness, right? So I invited a friend around, right? We actually had a little knot party. Uh, we got some string and it turns out they had, the knot they started with wasn't quite the 1011. It was a, it was a different knot. So we spent all evening, eventually we worked it out. I've left myself very open to string-based trolling. It has now occurred to me. So uh, please, only if you think you've got... Oh, goodness. Uh, send me an email and I will check. And hopefully, sooner or later, someone will do it. And mathematicians are working on having a much more systematic way of going about this. Instead of just having a go, trying to work out a way that, given any knot, you can calculate what crossing switches will undo it. And at the moment, bacteria are better at undoing knots than humans are. And, we, and that's not good because when bacteria reproduce, they unzip their DNA and their DNA gets very tangled. And what they do is they have little enzymes that go around and perform crossing switches. They will snip the DNA on one side, move it around another strand and join it back together again. And those enzymes in bacteria are more efficient at undoing knots in DNA than anything humans can do. And at the moment, biologists are working with mathematicians to try and work out, first of all, what the bacteria are doing, and secondly, how we can stop them from doing it. Because if we know what they're up to, we can somehow impede their ability to untangle themselves. And there's a whole future wave of, of medical, you know, uh, ways that we can combat bacteria if we had a better mathematical understanding of not. I think that's absolutely amazing. It's a fantastic ongoing area of maths research. Um, but up next uh, is some, a slightly more fun maths you can try at home. So if you get sick of playing with string, I'm going to show you a fantastic uh, activity you can do. Oh, oh I, I brought some other things for show and tell. Before I go to knots, right? are great, but there's a related area of links. And links are when you have more than one loop that go through each other. And there's a famous set of links called the Bromian rings. And uh, they're, they're pictured on this beer can. This is a beer can from the 1950s. I spent ages stalking it on uh, eBay. I eventually uh, managed to buy one. It's the one in the picture here. You can come and have a look at it if you want to afterwards. And the reason I really wanted it is the logo is a mathematical set of rings. They're called Bromian rings. And the way they work, the way those three links uh, go through each other, if you break any one of those three loops, the other two will come apart as well. So it only holds together as long as all three are intact. You break any one, the rest separate. And so here you can see they'll put purity, body, and flavor. Because if you remove any one of those from your beer, the, the beverage just falls apart. And I thought that's an amazing mathematical logo. And you can do it for more links. You can link four links, such that if you cut any one, the other three come apart. And it works for any number. For any n links, you can arrange them in such a way that if you cut one, the other n minus one uh, come apart as well. And I, I'd heard rumors about this can. I finally managed to buy one. I was so pleased. Recently, I was in New York uh, doing some maths talks. And I went for a bit of a walk before one of my uh, talks I was doing. And I walked past a billboard for the same beer, Valentine's beer. They still make this beer. And I saw a, I took a photo of me with it. I was so, I, I was so excited. I had no idea this beer still existed. And so you can see how, you see how happy I am. But then, suddenly, my excitement turned to distress because <laughs> they have changed the logo. They've taken the crossing markings off the logo, right? And so I did the talk, and in the talk I said, right, we have to get a, a, a bottle of this beer afterwards. We, we walked around several bars in New York demanding, do you have this beer? Eventually you found one that does. Um, I smuggled the bottle back into the country. There you are. And so if you want to 
I didn't declare it to customs, because uh, I have to put, what have you brought in? An empty beer bottle. <laughs> full of disappointment. Uh, and so if you look, oh, of course I brought the old can with me to the bar, so you can compare and contrast the two. I took a photo the next day in better light, right? So they've taken all the markings. People have tried to say, it's okay, Matt. They just turned it into a Venn diagram. <laughs> I'm not buying that, right? They have ruined all the maths of that link. So I, I am very upset. But if you'd like to come down afterwards, you can have a look uh, at, at the original and then the changed mathematical logo uh, of the beer. Right, so uh, on to a activity you can try yourself uh, at home. This, I'm going to show you now my all-time second favorite shape. So this is not the number one favorite shape. We'll work our way up to that. But my all-time second uh, favorite shape. And to make this, oh, this is not my second favorite shape, by the way. This is a rectangle. I mean, don't get me wrong. Big fan. But right, we can do better than just a straight up rectangle. What you can do is if you get a rectangle that is sufficiently skinny and you join the two ends together, you get a, a loop. Uh, the technical maths name for this is a boring shape. You can make it an exciting shape by taking the two ends apart, turning one of them over, so when you stick them together, you get a loop with a twist in it. Now, many of you, because I know the sort of people who come along to these things, will have seen one of these before. It was invented by a guy called Mr. Mobius in the late 1800s, and he was so excited uh, when he made what we now know as the Mobius Loop that he proceeded to name himself after the shape. And the great... Not everything tonight is a fact. I should make that very clear. So the grazing thing about the Mobius Loop, it's got all sorts of unusual properties. So some of you will have heard that it's only got one side. It's also only got one edge, which is amazing, and does all sorts of strange things. But the, the best thing you can do with a Mobius Loop is, a, is an activity when you've got two of them that are exactly the same length. And to get to the same length, you can see I've used paper that's reasonably wide. If I make a single snip in the center there, and because I originally taped it all together at once, I cut through the tape, I'm going to get two loops precisely the same length. Okay, so I get back to where I started. And so now I've cut that in half. I What? I've just blown your minds. Right, so, right, so the Mobius loop can't be cut in half. It's a, I genuinely cut it in half. Like I properly cut right down the center. There's no funny business there. If you cut a Mobius loop in half, you end up with one piece, a single loop. And that just freaks me out. <laughs> but it gets worse. If you take a longer rectangle to start with, this time, when you start with your zero twist uh, cylinder, if you, instead of doing one twist, if you do one, then two, then three, you get what's called a three twist Mobius loop. And if it seems at all familiar, uh, it's because it is uh, the recycling logo. There you are. <laughs> so, then you know, the next time you're walking down the street and you see the recycling logo, you can go, hey, that is a three-twist Mobius loop. <laughs> that only works if there's someone next to you. I should <laughs> look insane otherwise. Anyway, right, so a three-twist Mobius loop. I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. I'm going to try and cut it right down the center in your own minds without calling it out. I want you to see if you can guess, once I cut right down the middle of a three-twist Mobius loop, how many pieces of paper will I end up with? Will it be, still be one loop? Will I get two or will I get three? In your own minds, decide. Okay, and it turns out I get that. <laughs> Give it a second. Here we go. Right. Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it two? It turns out it's one. It's a single loop, but now there is a knot tied in it, <laughs> right? So I started with a loop of paper with no knots. I cut it down the center and it tangled itself. At no point did I undo the loop. So somehow a knot got in there and that, oh, for any knot fans in, that's a trefoil. Uh, and so if I, <laughs> some of you will be here, uh, and it, I can't get rid of it. It's like a trivial knot. It's properly in there. In fact, it takes one crossing switch to get rid of it. And actually that is how the knots get in DNA, because DNA is a very, very twisted, uh, very long strand. When it reproduces, it unzips down the middle, just like I did. You cut it right down the middle. And by cutting a twisted loop in half, it ties itself in knots. And some bacteria, and apparently some human cells, 
not a biologist, uh, have circular DNA. And so you end up with very, very knotted. Even if the two ends aren't joined together, by cutting a tangled thing in half, it gets incredibly knotted. And so that's where the knots come from when DNA reproduces, and you have to do crossing switches to get rid of them. But the fact that by cutting a loop, you get a knot really messes with my head. But it gets worse. I skipped <clears throat> right over our friend the zero twist because this is quite a boring shape. If I was to cut this in half for you right in the center, I would just get two zero twists. Not that exciting. I'm going to make one slight change. I've got another cylinder here. I'm going to stick both of them together at right angles. I'm then going to cut them both in half while they're stuck together. Oh, and if any of you are going to try this at home afterwards, <laughs> and a lot of you are, right? make sure you put plenty of tape on both sides. Because if you don't tape it together sufficiently well, it will come undone while you're cutting through them. OK, there we go. Right. So again, in your own minds, without calling it out, without ruining it for anyone else, see if you can guess how many pieces of paper I'm going to get. And if you think you've got a good guess of that, have a guess what shape or shapes those pieces of paper will be. Right, here we go, right through the first one. We get that. All right, through the second one. And I end up with a square. Yeah. Yes. So good. So good. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, right, but obviously uh, there's most of the audience you're down here, and you are all my favourites. Uh, anyone arriving late or other people who now look shocked uh, are sat up the very, very top over here. And occasionally people have been popping in, particularly people who work at the RI, because they're like, what is this maths comedy thing all about? So they've been coming in. It didn't happen. I was really hoping someone would come in right then, right, because all they would see is me going, hey guys, a square! <laughs> and you're like, a square! Oh my god, a round of applause for the... <laughs> Wait till you guys see a triangle! My goodness, right, so, some, some advanced maths to know. Anyway, right, but I think that is amazing that two loops both cut in half give you a square. In fact, you can reverse that to see why. If I uh, put these two ends back together like that, if I identify those two edges, I get a strip of paper with a loop at each end. And if I then put those two loops back together so that they line up, that's my original two cylinders at right angles to each other. You cut that one in half and you get that. You cut that one in half and you get a square. But it gets worse. <laughs> two Mobius loops stuck together at right angles. I'm going to cut... This is the last one. There are no more down there. Right, I, I am going to cut, without talking, for both of these in half at the same time. And then I want you to try and guess in your own minds, without calling it out, how many, how many pieces of paper and what shape or shapes do you think they will be? Right, I have cut all the way through the first one and I've got that. Right, okay, here we go. It will take me a second to untangle these when I'm done, by the way. I'm cutting through the second one. And I end up with... It's two hearts that go through each other. <laughs> oh, that... that don't... No, no. Too late. Right? So I held these up and you're like, no. Nah. And then there was just silence. And then one person went, wait a minute. We applauded the square. <laughs> if we don't applaud this, we're officially dead inside. Right? It's, it's too late though. Uh, so that is absolutely brilliant, right? And so, oh, you now know what I gave uh, my girlfriend for Valentine's Day last year. <laughs> Two Mobius loops and a pair of scissors. Uh, <laughs> And instructions, right? And so, oh, and we got married last July. So, you know, boom, it works. That's, yeah. That's, that's the most expensive mass proof I've ever done. And so, um, oh, uh, the wedding ring is iron nickel meteorite, right? It's so very different talk. See me afterwards. <laughs> what a substance. Anyway, right, so that is absolutely brilliant. If you want to make one of these, then uh, there's a secret to bear in mind. 
when you make a Mobius loop, you're actually faced with a choice. You can either twist it to the right or you can twist it to the left and you get a right-handed or a left-handed Mobius loop. They're mirror images of each other, they're different shapes. For the hearts to work, you've got to have a right-handed attached to a left-handed. Right? If you attach them both and they're both the same uh, twist, then you don't get two hearts, you get like a boat. <laughs> And a thing, I don't know. Right? They're not even joined together. It is a world of disappointment. <laughs> and so, right? To, oh, teachers! I've just planned your next lesson back, right? So, right, this is so good, particularly with six formers, right? Because if you do this with six formers, you do the whole lesson, like, uh, send me an email, I'll send you the worksheets, right? And as you go along, at the beginning of the lesson, you say, all right, class, make sure you pay very close attention and follow all the instructions very carefully. And they're all like, please. Follow instructions, right? And then you don't tell them about the twist, right? And the third of them by accident will do it right and get the two hearts, and the rest will get the boat and the thing, right? <laughs> and then you walk around going, I told you to pay attention, it's so good, right? And then they would do, they'll do it again, and they'll do exactly what their friend's doing, and it, it'll work for them, and it won't work for us. So then their head will explode. It's, <laughs> I still miss teaching sometimes. Uh, right, so, right, it's absolutely great fun, but I want to get to my favorite shape, which is in the fourth dimension. So I'm now going to show you what the fourth dimension looks like. And uh, again, we're, we're, going to, we're going to come running at this. And a lot of people are vaguely familiar with dimensions from an area of mass you might not expect. So when you're at school, you will have been forced to draw uh, charts. You will have been forced to plot things on graphs. And when you were doing that, you were actually working with dimensions. And so in two dimensions, you've only got two directions you can move in. You've got up and down, and you've got left and right. And that's, a, that's an x, y axis uh, graph, where you plot things onto it. And in fact, if you, uh, you can start plotting a variety of coordinates. And I've put on here all the combinations of 0 and 1 on, on that thing there. And you do this quite a bit. You do it in maths because it's fun. Uh, you do it in science because if you've done an experiment and there's two different things you're measuring, then you can plot two bits of data simultaneously as data points on an x, y uh, coordinate. In fact, more people should use two-dimensional plots than they do. Most people stick to one-dimensional plots, which I think is ridiculous. So, for example, uh, the football, football Premier League, have a league table with only one dimension, right? It's just straight up and down, right? You could, if you wanted, plot all premiership teams in two dimensions and you get a 2D league table. It would look a little bit like this, right? And so what you've done, right, I've plotted net wins. That's the number of wins subtract the number of losses. None of this two points ridiculousness, right? And then on, on this one here, I've plotted the goals. Number of goals scored subtract number of goals conceded. As you can see, some teams have scored a negative number of goals, right? And so now, at the end of the season, you just calculate which team is the greatest distance from the origin, and, and they win. It's all very straightforward. Um, I can't believe they haven't. Uh, they haven't implemented this, right? You can use arguments to solve arguments. Uh, and so, oh, if you're trying to spot your favorite uh, team, there you go. And so, I think that you've already gotten more sport than you were expecting. Don't be disappointed, right? And so, you can plot great things in two dimensions. And if, in this case, you've done all the combinations of zero and one, then what you've actually done is plotted the coordinates of the corners of a square. We can do the same thing in three dimensions. We've now got three different directions we can move. We've got up and down, left, right, and now you've got out. And so uh, this is the reality we live in, right? We have three directions we can move, up and down, left and right, and out and back, and then combinations of those. So we can go across and out, or we could just take a shortcut there. And if you put on every combination of zeros and ones when you've got three coordinates, and so in science this happens quite a bit. You do an experiment with uh, three different uh, types of data, you can plot it on a 3D plot. But if you join together all the combinations of zeros and ones on a 3D plot, you get the corners of a cube. And you could now do this one dimension higher. If you had a 4D plot, and the problem here is we can't imagine that. Because for a 4D plot, you'd have left and right, uh, up and down, out and back, and then another direction. 
Another direction that we just can't even try and visualize, which is a real shame. But it would be very useful. In science, you do experiments where you have four different things you're measuring. If you've got four different types of data you want to plot on the same graph, you need a 4D plot. And you can do this, but sadly, you can't see it easily. So you lose that visual link. But there is still a few, well, there are a few ways that you can visualize what a 4D cube will look like. And I'm going to try and show you tonight what a 4D cube uh, would seem like. And to do that, what's really handy is to imagine how we would show a 3D cube to a 2D creature. So if you had a 3D cube and you wanted to show it to someone who's perfectly flat, right, you could uh, take a cube. One way is to take your cube and then uh, unfold it into its net. So that is one way to go down a dimension. You can take a 3D cube and unfold it into its net. In fact, what I have here is a video of a net folding and unfolding into a 3D cube. Oh, I'm not trying to patronize you, but are we all happy that is a video of a 2D net folding into a 3D cube? Okay. No, well, mixed, okay, uh, because, because it's not. That is not a video of a 2D net folding into a 3D cube. That is a video of the shadow of a 2D net folding into a 3D cube, right? At the top there, I've got the 3D cube. I can then unfold it into its 2D net. All I was showing you before was the bit underneath. You can see there's a light above it, and it's casting a shadow onto that flat surface. But your brain is so used to things being in 3D that when I showed you the bottom bit, your brain imagined the top bit. Oh, you are, of course, now watching this projected on a wall, but don't think about it for too long, right? And so, just take the essence, okay? Right, so, right, what you're looking at the bottom there is the shadow of what's happening above it. But you could reconstruct the situation above just by watching the shadow underneath. And what's great is just like 3D objects can cast 2D shadows, 4D objects can cast 3D shadows. So even though I cannot show you an actual 3D object, what I can show you is the, the 4D object. What I can show you is the 3D shadow of that 4D object. And so what I've got here, this is our 2D net of a 3D cube. What I have over next to it is the 3D net of a 4D cube. And just like before, you could watch the shadow of this one folding up one dimension higher. I'm now going to show you the 3D shadow of the 3D net folding into a 4D cube. And it looks a little bit like this. And it goes and over. That's not so bad. Now, if you watch the one you're used to, if, if you start feeling a bit queasy and a bit dimension sick, right, <laughs> Look at this side, because this one's okay, this is safe. And if you think about it, when the lid turns over onto the top of the cube, on this one we're used to, it looks like, in the shadow, it looks like it stretches around. And we know it's not stretching around, we know it's just turning over. But when it turns over one dimension higher, its shadow looks like it's stretching. So over here, that purple cube at the top is not stretching over, it's turning over. But when a cube turns over in 4D, it can look like it stretches around uh, in 3D. And the actual moment it's folded together, it looks like this here. That is the 3D shadow of a 4D cube. But because it's a shadow, I've it's been cast in such a way that it's got perspective. So that blue cube in the middle is actually the same size as the red cube on the outside, except it's further away in 4D. And when things get further away in 4D, they look smaller in 3D. Just like if I showed you this, you all know the blue square is smaller than the red square. You go, well, of course the blue square is smaller than the red square. It just is the same size. It just looks smaller because it's further away. So you know red square, blue square, same size, but one looks smaller in its shadow because of perspective. In fact, if you set this cube rotating, they take turns being the big one. Right, so the, the blue one's big, and then the red one's big, and it looks like they're going through each other, but they're not actually going through each other, they're going in front and behind. But if you just look at what's happening on the screen, the red and blue are at the same place quite a bit, they look like they're going through there. And then they take turns getting big and small. I can do the same thing. I can take the 3D shadow of the 4D cube, and then I can set the 4D cube 
rotating. And it looks like this. So now they're taking turns being bigger and smaller. But they're not actually bigger or smaller. They're, they're both still the same size all the time. They're just getting closer and further away uh, in 4D. And they look like they're going through each other. But they're not going through each other. They're going in front and behind one dimension higher. But when they go in front and behind in 4D from our you know, pathetic 3D point of view, it looks like they're going through each other. At this point, if your head's not hurting, you're not paying attention. <laughs> all right. Unfortunately, it now gets worse. So, uh, oh, if you want to try this yourself at home, you can build higher dimensional cubes out of straws. All right, I, I, I strongly recommend you do this. In fact, if you want to start with a 1D cube, to build a 1D cube out of straws, pick up a straw and you're done. <laughs> there you are. 1D cube, commonly referred to as a line. I'm going to use red for the first dimension. If you then add some more straws, you can make a square. So I've still got the red going one way, the blue now goes the other way. If you bring in a third colour, I've got yellow, you end up with uh, a cube. And if you then get another cube and join it together in all possible corners to this one, you get a... Oh, oh sorry, that is the same thing. I forgot, I made, this is a new model I just made. Right? That is the same cube, but I've done it with perspective. So that's a perfectly flat shape, but it looks like a 3D cube from perspective. Because what you can do one dimension higher is you can make the wireframe model of a 4D cube that's without perspective, and then this is with perspective. So I've shrunk down one of the cubes and popped it in the center. And so you end up with this, this, the, this, all the edges, all the corners, everything's there of a 4D cube, but built out of straws. Oh, pipe cleaners. Use pipe cleaners for the corners. You just twist two of them together, cut off the extra bits, and you've got a nice way to uh, hook the... It's all explained in great detail in a book I can highly recommend. <laughs> uh, now. The other way you can look at higher dimensional shapes is, what, is if you drop them into a lower dimensional universe. So this is what happens if you take a 3D square and drop it into a 2D world. Does that. Right? And if you were living in that 2D world and someone dropped a 3D square on you, it would look like a 3D cube, 3D square, same thing. Right? It, would, it would look like a square appears and then disappears. So it comes in and then it goes out. And all you'd see is suddenly a square and then no square. You're like, well, that's not very exciting. But we can do better. If you drop the 3D cube edge first, it looks like a rectangle comes in and then goes out again. So it's rectangle in, rectangle out. And if you were a 2D creature, you'd see a rectangle appear and then go away again. And what you're seeing is a kind of series of 2D slices through a 3D cube. And, uh, and, uh, but if you were a 2D creature, you would have no idea what's actually happening. All you would see are the slices come in and go out. You'd have no idea what's going on over here. You'd see that. And you, from that, you've got to recreate what a 3D cube looks like from those 2D slices. I can now show you what it would look like if someone took a 4D cube and dropped it onto our 3D world and it passed through edge first. And it looks a little bit like this, and it comes, around it goes, and out. If you're ever walking down the street, and you see this, a, a triangular prism appear in front of you, distort and go back out again, someone is now throwing 4D cubes at you. <laughs> I recommend running. <laughs> right? But it could be worse, because you can drop things corner first. Here's a 3D cube going through a 2D world corner first. You get a triangle that comes in, distorts, and goes out. Again, a 2D creature would have no idea what's going on. They'll see, wow, it's a triangle comes in one way. It goes through the space that's filled by a hexagon and goes back out the other way. All right? We can do the same thing one dimension higher. If you take a 4D cube and you drop it corner first onto a 3D universe, it looks like this. And it comes, right? it goes, and out. If you're ever walking down the street <laughs> and you see this come in, distort and go out, right? Someone's now throwing 4D cubes at you, pointy end first. <laughs> Somehow you've annoyed them, right? <laughs> Definitely run, possibly put on a hat. <laughs> Sparkle's optional. Oh, that's why you wore it. You're like, well, safety first with 4D cubes. I mean, right, so right, that is absolutely incredible. Oh, and it's a bit like the triangle one dimension lower, but here it's a, a tetrahedron. It's a, it's a triangular pyramid that comes in, distorts, and goes out facing the other way. Absolutely amazing. But you ask yourself, is this 
Matt's all-time favorite shape. And no, it is not, right? My all-time favorite shape is the 4D equivalent to the Mobius loop. You can make a Mobius loop. What, what, oh, by the way, what I love about doing family shows at the RI, because everyone's here in family, so it's all family units. A lot of parents and kids, parents and kids. My game I play while I'm talking is guess who dragged who along. <laughs> oh, so good. Right, often you see the parent just elbow going, I told, look, I told you, learn, learn it. Right? <laughs> and then often you see the kids like, oh, the, the parents are just going, oh, I'm going to have to buy so much stuff when we go home. Right? And so, right. Anyway, right, so my all-time favorite shape, right? And it's okay, we're, we're, I'll finish on this, right? My all-time absolute favorite shape. To make a Mobius loop, a Mobius loop only works in 3D. It is a 2D surface, but it requires three dimensions to join it together. And we can extend the pattern into a higher dimension. So when I made a normal Mobius loop, you could imagine that I start with a square, and then I join the two ends together. And you can see here, I've indicated with arrows how to join the ends together. I say, I want you to join the two ends together so that the arrows match. We call them matching instructions. And if you try and do that with a piece of paper, but you keep it on a flat surface, you can't get the arrows to line up. If you try and stretch it around and put them together, they don't match. If they matched, you'd get a cylinder with no twists. Right? To get them to line up, what you need to do is take one end, lift it up and turn it over, and then put it down. And to do that, you've had to pick it up into the third dimension and put a twist into it, and now the two ends do line up. Uh, oh, and if, if you look at this, if you were a 2D creature looking at this, you'd go, hang on. This is cheating, because it looks like this edge here just magically goes through the middle, right, right there. It's drawn in the middle of the surface. The 2D creature's like, you can't just put an edge to the middle of the face. That's ridiculous. And we're like, no, 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 it doesn't go through. It goes over. But when it goes over in 3D, it looks like it goes through from a 2D point of view. And uh, so only in 3D can you fully appreciate the wonder of the Mobius loop. Now to do it one dimension higher. What you do is you start with a piece of paper, but this time with more matching instructions. I've got two sets of arrows. I've got the red ones and the blue ones. Now, the red ones are easy. I can join those together and I get uh, a cylinder. I then go to join the blue ones together. And to do that, I stretch it around. I go to line them up. Now, if they matched and I joined them together, you would get a, a, a tube that joins up with itself. And that's fine. That's the shape that in mathematics we call a torus. <laughs> which in physics, they call a donut. And <laughs> physicist, man, right? And so it is, it is an amazing shape, the torus donut, right? And so I've got a, a model of it here. It is, it is an amazing shape. Uh, you can do things on a torus that you can't do on a flat surface, right? So a donut is still great. There's a famous problem in maths. If you want to try this afterwards, it's a great puzzle where it's called the utilities puzzle, where you've got three uh, houses and you want to join them all up to three different uh, sources of utilities. You've got the, power, the gas company, power company, and the water company. And you need to join them up such that the pipes don't cross. Right, so you've got to draw a line from each house to all three utilities with none of the lines crossing each other. And I called it a puzzle, and uh, what mathematicians call a puzzle, in this case, is impossible. Which is proof that mathematicians can be jerks. Right? You cannot solve this on a flat surface, but if these houses were on a donut, you can solve it. In fact, I've got a mug which has this printed on it because it's possible to solve it on a mug because you have the handle. And a mug is the same shape as a donut because you've got that extra bit uh, stretched around. Oh, any, any maths people in? If you're familiar with the four-color problem, any flat surface will need four colors or fewer to color in any combination of regions so that no two contacting regions have the same color. On a torus, you need seven colors. And so I designed a mug with all seven colors on it. Right? And so I've got six different, seven different regions, and each one contacts all, seven, all six other regions to show that they all have to be different colors. I brought it along. If you want to have a look at this afterwards, come down and have a play with it. It, right? There it is there. There is my seven uh, colored torus. Come down, have a look at it, have a play with it. Abs absolutely amazing. But, right, torus, wonderful, love it. It's a 3D shape. We've all played with it before. You may have eaten one. We can do better. <laughs> what would a 4D twisted donut 
look like. And for that to happen, you need to join the two ends of this tube together so they face different directions. So they, they twist different ways. But how do you turn over the end of a tube? You can't rotate it because it will still be clockwise or anti-clockwise, right? The only way to join the two ends of this tube together so the arrows match is to shove one side through the other one, then fold it back, then join it up. All right? And you get this shape. This is a twisted donut. It is a shape called the Klein bottle. It only properly works in 4D because this bit here looks like it goes through the side. In fact, I've got a 3D model of it. It looks like this tube goes through the surface. In 4D, it doesn't. In 4D, it goes around. It's, it's as good as a donut in four dimensions. It doesn't go through itself. Annoyingly, in 3D, with this, this is the 3D shadow of it, it always looks like it goes through itself. Very disappointing, but what are you going to do? <laughs> because in 3D, at least you can make it, right? You can make them out of glass. 4D glass, very expensive. Uh, I've brought with me this one here. So if you want to have a play with it, there's one down the front here. It's called the Klein bottle. It is my all-time favorite shape. It's absolutely amazing. I've got, actually, I've got more than one model. I've got another one here, right, which is based on a conical flask. right? And so, oh, these are so good, actually, because, right, oh, yeah, one. Is this sink plumbed in? We're about to find out. <laughs> it's the RI, I'm doing an experiment, right? Okay, so right, if you pour water into the bottle, you can see it goes in fine. Look at that, right? And then if you try and get it back out again, that's a lot more difficult. <laughs> right, and so I just realized I'm doing this over a national treasure, right? This is Faraday's desk, and I'm there going, oh, look at the water, right? And so. <laughs> The world's first electric motor was demonstrated right here. <laughs> I made some hearts. Uh, right. <laughs> so, but, but this is so, let's, just, let's not lose sight of what's important though, right? Actually, next time you go to a party, bring drinks in one of these. Right? <laughs> it's so good because you'd be like, oh, cheers, thanks. What? <laughs> but how did it get in there? <laughs> right, so, oh, and you can get it back out again. If you get it into the handle, it'll go around the handle and then out and all the. <laughs> all over the floor. <laughs> okay, if you want to help me drag the desk back on top of this, right, and no, so, right, so this, right, if you want to have a play with this, take it over there. Uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. You're welcome to come and have a look and a play with that. It's absolutely brilliant. Although, as always, people say, right, okay, so the Klein bottle, it's a wonderful 4D, well, it's the 3D shadow of a 4D shape. People always say, well, what is the point? What is the use of it? Well, for a start, it makes for a mighty fine hat. <laughs> no, you can... You can knit the 3D shadow of the 4D. Guys, so I was so excited. So when I realized this could happen, I went to my mum, right? Because my mum can knit. I said, Mum, you have got to knit me the 3D shadow of a 4D twisted donut so I can wear it as a hat. <laughs> and she was like, What have I raised? <laughs> and then we had this conversation where I was talking perfectly reasonable maths, but she was speaking fluent knitting. Uh, but eventually we worked it out and we made one. I've, I've got it here, right? I've got a picture of my hat up there, right? And so you can see, oh, if you want to see what it looks like when I'm wearing it, it looks like that. So <laughs> what happens is the hat becomes a tube. The tube then goes through the side of the hat. And then if I reach in there and pull the tube through, the tube folds back on itself, right, to carry on. So this is a never-ending tube of knitting. It's a donut of knitting that goes through itself. And it keeps your head warm. It's so good, right? If you want. That is just creeping me out now. All right, if you, if, if you want the knitting pattern, seriously, send me an email. I'll send you a copy, right? It's so good. Oh, well, you may have noticed, right, that this hat is stripy. Now, the first version that my, so the very first one of these my mum made for me, uh, which I called the prototype, which she called the perfectly good gift, right? Um, it didn't have any stripes. It was all the same color. I said, mum, could you make me another one of these that has stripes? And she's like, well, yeah, I can do that, no problem. I just change the color of the wool as I go. I said, oh, good. Oh, could the stripes be different thicknesses? Could I have thick ones and thin ones? He's like, well, yeah, I just do a different number of rows. I said, ah, good, good. What if I gave you a long list of numbers? Could you make each stripe the thickness of the next number on the list? Uh, and so this, ladies and gentlemen, these are the digits of pi knitted into a 4D hat. <laughs> this is officially the world's nerdiest hat. Uh, 
If you would like to meet the hat afterwards, I will leave it down here. You can come and take a photo of you wearing the hat. That is absolutely fine. If you can convince a loved one to knit it for you, sorry parents, uh, they, they come in a variety of sizes. Send me an email. Uh, now, very quickly, before we wrap up, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. The very last thing I want to show you before I, uh, we stop for questions and you get, then you get to go back into the real world, is what if, when you go home, you want to actually have your own 4D shape to play with and you haven't got the time or effort to knit it? Well, you can go online and you can play with a 4D cube. And the reason you can do that is because online, there is a 4D Rubik's cube. All right, so the, here is our standard 3D cube. <laughs> right, this, right, instead of trying to get 2D stickers onto the 2D surface of a 3D cube, here you have to get the 3D stickers onto the 3D surface of a cell of a 4D cube, right, and to twist it, right, if you click on one of the 3D stickers, if it's the center of a rotatable face, it will then set it rotating, right, and so you can rotate that and fall, oh, you notice it comes back after two twists, right, that's, if you turn it over twice in 4D, it looks like it's, oh, that's why, um, People think USB cables are 4D objects, right? Because you go to plug it in, doesn't fit. Turn it over, plug it in, doesn't fit. <laughs> turn it over, hey! Right? So, right, and so this, <laughs> proof, right? And, right? and so the problem is, right, you've, to solve it, you've got to move it around in 3D. Because what you're doing is you're grabbing and moving the 3D shadow around in front of you, but you can still move it four different ways. So you've got the standard three different ways you can drag it around. To go in the fourth dimension, uh, it turns out on the internet, the fourth dimension, you hold down uh, control. It doesn't work for many websites. And then it will rotate in the fourth direction, right? So the outside pops uh, into the inside. And so, oh, there's always one face you can't see at any point in time because you're in the wrong dimension. Uh, and, oh, oh, one final problem. Uh, you're not actually, because it looks like you're just moving around the 3D shadow of the 4D uh, Rubik's Cube. In fact, though, you're doing it on a computer monitor, and computer mice only move in two dimensions, up and down, left and right. And so what you're actually doing is you're manipulating the 2D projection of the 3D projection of the 4D Rubik's Cube. And if that sounds too easy, there is, of course, a 5D Rubik's Cube, <laughs> in which, at which point I've probably gone too far, so I'm going to finish there. Thank you all very much.